In sports, if you want to be the best, there are no off days. Welcome on into the No Off Days podcast. Chris Cato next to me. We got BK in the booth. I am Scott Smith. Uh, I gotta be. I gotta be honest. I'm a little down this week. I mean, it feels like uh, all my best friends are leaving. Last week it was Tukes that we said goodbye oh, yeah. to. We had his retirement show, and then this week, of course, Stephen Stamkos. I don't know if they were a package deal leaving together, <laughs> but. It's just uh, I, we have to regroup. We have we're losing a couple of icons here. Is Tuke's going to Nashville too? Is he going to be working well, he, at a he, Nashville TV station? I mean, he's got the pipes for it. Yeah, he might, he you know, finally kick off that music career. The only thing that's providing a little bit of optimism this week is is my unbridled patriotism. Uh, yes, it is. It is of course Fourth of July week, Thank so we celebrate for that. all week. Do you uh, do you have uh, old glory? flowing in she, your front yard well, she you, has you been ever? flowing since the lightning lost in the playoffs i i don't have a raised flag but i took down the lightning flag and i put um old glory up and okay. she's beauty through rainstorms and thunderstorms and okay, everything well you're supposed to take better yeah. care well, of her we have so that. many thunderstorms okay. here in florida i yeah. can't really be inconvenienced yeah. I, but she's tough you know one of the rules i think if you fly the flag you have to light it up at night right yes isn't that one of the rules yes i okay. set it on fire no yeah it's lit up every night i have my porch well, lights out there yeah no i <laughs> totally okay. it, i'm all into the patriotism all right. right now I, I bring mine down at night and then I, I bring it back out in the morning it's just a good reminder your patriotism you know? or your flag my both yeah absolutely <laughs> It's hard to be patriotic while I'm sleeping, you know. It's pretty self-centered. <laughs> Not for me. I sleep in red, white, and blue pajamas. <laughs> and I'm proud to be. You, you, do you sleep to Lee Greenwood? Does yeah, he put we, you to sleep? Always. <laughs> you know what we won't be doing on 4th of July? Watching the Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest right, because the goat's not in it. That, yeah, I know. What a shame. What a yeah. shame. All right, speaking of goats, let's bring in Brian <laughs> King, BK. Uh, are you a big hot dog consumer on the 4th? Uh yeah, I yeah. we do you, eat do hot you dogs. grill. You do you grill. Is that Always like part of hot the... dogs? Yeah, okay. and uh, hamburgers, all that stuff. Yeah, it's fun. Fourth of July. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Did you did you buy any fireworks? No, I'm I'm done with the fireworks. The fireworks uh, has passed me by. Girls are all grown up. They're going to college. So no yeah. need to blow things up anymore, huh? No, yeah, and I made it this far with ten fingers. So I might as well just quit pressing my luck on that yeah and 11 toes I, scott, right. I think scott's i think scott's more the pyromaniac in the group anyway no, if it, no if i it, mean uh, yeah we like to do a little firework but i feel like you know i growing up in california where i th- like there was no fireworks like we it was off limits because of course they would start a forest fire yeah. um but you you move to florida and it's like whenever you get to the the fourth um, any really any holiday any they're excuse. selling fireworks yeah. and the thing is like there's no uh, time frame like it's it's just right. going on all hours of the day into the morning <laughs> somebody's doing yeah. it still yeah and the later it is you know how more like that that whatever that situation is wherever it is it's happening uh, it's you know it's it's fueled by alcohol yeah. and it's not going to end well. It's just s- someone's going to get shot at by one of these mortar rounds. Every so. year in Florida, unfortunately, there and it's usually somebody's homemade uh, launching device that they <laughs> they've tried to make something better and they've souped it up right. and it it ends terribly. What will gasoline do to this thing? I can't believe that didn't work. <laughs> Blow up the Buick, Ford. Yeah. All right. There we go. So um, yeah, it is uh, the it is the Fourth uh, of July week and we are celebrating. Uh, America this week, but uh, what else do we have on today's program? BK? We're going to check in with Bobby the Chief Taylor. Nice. Mm, right. Yeah, I mean, we got middle some summer. For him. We, I bet y'all do. Yeah. What, a, what a week for the lighting, and holy smokes. Yeah, a lot of change, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I think when the news first came down, I was a little bit like, ah, I, I didn't think this was, was going to happen, but uh, then I see kind of Brisebois pulling his strings and bringing guys in, and I'm and I'm I'm believing again. So yeah. one of the things I will say that among all the moves that took place is that what stood out to me is how it reflects on Jeff Vinnick as an owner, because he allows his guys to do their thing. There's not, a, you know, I know that he loves Steven Stamkos, mm-hmm. you know, but he's, you know, ultimately he's about making, you know, empowering. The guys below him, uh, Julian Brisbois, to do his job and to do it well. And I don't know. I, who knows what the long-term future is going to be for this current makeup, this roster. But 
uh, I don't know. It just kind of sticks out like Jeff Vinnick is allowing. He's not meddling. He's he's an owner that lets his guys that he's hired do their thing. Or are you and, saying uh, you feel like there are other owners who would have said, ah, you know, they oh, put a, put a motion into it without and, and question. oh, we owe Stamco something and without we got it. Yeah, without question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and sometimes that pays off. And I, I still think Stammer's going to have a great season in Nashville. I mean, that, Ooh, the team yeah. they're building out there is um, kind of ridiculous. It's impressive. Yeah, and he, we found out today as of this taping, they're coming here. Predators are coming what here is that, October November? or yeah no yeah, it was is late it November October. or October October tenth October. I think it's the tenth game of the season so oh, it's right there that's yeah. gonna be so strange how are they gonna, how are they gonna honor him <clears throat> they I don't got know. I mean it's, there's gonna be a video yeah I mean th- there'll be a long standing ovation I I, I don't know make uh, it something that our Mark makes Wilson him... suggested that maybe they retire ninety one no no uh, uh, let's wait it's too soon right yeah, yeah. yeah. let's just you yeah, do a little video tribute and yeah. you know Vinny's got to be with guys. another t- he's got to be done he, before right. he retire the thing right. but let's do something make him emotional so that it, he starts off a little <laughs> sluggish sad. in the game very, yeah. Very sad. yeah he's very yeah. sad just weeping yeah. uncontrollably forgets how to he, shoot he yeah can't, he can't play hockey right. yeah uh, that sounds like a good plan okay at the end of the show at the end of the show how about a little quiz on the fourth of July like a hist like a history test it's a, like yeah a little bit histories in there a little bit of uh, just fourth of July trivia see how well you know okay, uh, okay. Uh, Francis State. Scott Key yes uh, that's that's well, one of them. is that yeah. one okay. no you're gonna have to, you no know, has nothing to do you with have it. Time um, to change apple menu. pie no. apple pie no All he's right. gonna answer one of those two for every question you ask <laughs> All right. very good BK we'll catch up with you shortly thanks guys uh, if you're listening and you want to watch go to fox13news.com slash nod pod if you're watching and you want to listen or subscribe take out your phone you can zap that QR code in the screen and there you can find all of our shows uh, please subscribe fox13news.com slash nod pod and we invite you to give a five star a like share Share with family members. Yes. Those that are as patriotic as we are. And those who aren't. Share it with everyone. (laughs) Please. (laughs) All right. So uh, speaking of patriotism, I mean, when we watch the U.S. men's soccer team on the the global stage, it just seems like, like you start with a lot of hope. A lot of optimism, bright young future, bright young players out there. Yeah. And then they, they just disappoint you. I mean, we saw this happen with the, the Copa America out in the group play stage. Uh, the loss to Panama. Then, of course, the loss to Uruguay. 1-0, not able to get on the board. And now the U.S. Soccer Federation is saying that they're going to have a comprehensive review, which is, of course, uh, code for uh, fire Greg Berhalter. Uh, um, I mean, likely that – look, I, I mean, as we tape this, he has he still has a job. But that's – Everybody's clamoring for that. And, and on, you know, when it comes to, you know, your, your national team, there's, not, there's only so much you can do. I mean, you can't, like, retool a roster with two years before the, the, the World, World Cup. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to make changes, it's probably going to be the guy at the top, right? Don't you think? I just don't know who they're going to go after, though, because the guy – Alexi Lawless. Yeah, there he is. Sign him up. No, but the other guy that was in the mix before they hired Burhalter in 2018 is now coaching Canada. I mean – I don't, I don't know if they – you know, it has been stagnant. And here's the thing that has people doubting. I, I just wonder, stagnant is, might be generous. I mean, they're taking a step back. I mean, they, they at least made yeah. it out of group stage in the it 22 was a flop. games. Yeah, it was the Burr halter falter for sure. And <laughs> what makes it hard for them is that they have, we're told, the most talented roster they've ever had. And you yeah. have some guys that are actually playing very well overseas now. You know, Pulisic just had his best – season at, at AC Milan. You have Ms. McKinney had a great year with Juventus, Chris Richardson in the Premier League as well. And so this was supposed to be setting the stage for greatness at the World Cup, which we're hosting, and it was the opposite of that. Right, and, and the thing that, that just kind of turns the knife even more is the fact that it happened on U.S. soil. You know, like mm-hmm. you, you have the opportunity here, and this was supposed to be kind of the 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 onboarding phase of the World Cup in two years like this is like they they take a deep run in Copa America and then you know it's it's on to the World Cup where we're actually going to make some hay yeah. um, so I mean who knows what can happen in two years you know they in KC the other night they the fans are chanting fire Greg uh, everybody's calling for it I'm not I, I again I don't know enough about the product to be able to really discern where the 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 fault lies totally uh, but I just it's very common that head coaches are replaced uh, when they're not getting the job done. And, um, you know, what I've heard is that, like, players actually like him. Mm-hmm. They're comfortable with him. That You know, like, they're okay with him. He, they don't think he's the problem. But maybe that is the problem. Is like, maybe you need a coach that you're not comfortable with. Maybe you need a coach that uh, is going to push you and to, to drive you 
to get the best out of yourself, you know, that applies to any sport, right? Like, yeah. you don't necessarily want to coach. The players that love their coach, sometimes, you know, being a player's coach is not – it's not great, you know, because you're not able to pull that excellence out of them. You know, how yeah. many players loved playing for Nick Saban while they played for him? About two. Yeah. And same with Bill Belichick. But they probably. won. Yeah. And, and that's that's what good coaches do. I'm going to push you to the point where you're comfortable and beyond. And then yeah. and that's when we start to get the best out of you. Maybe that's what they need. And I don't yeah. know who that guy is. I don't know. Yeah. His record, let's see, against teams inside the top 20 in the FIFA rankings, uh, five and 18. So not, not no bueno. Good. Yeah, no bueno. Um, so, yeah, where do you go from here? And you've got two years to figure it out before World Cup time. We're talking college football. And, <laughs> yes. of course, conference realignment is now official. That's it. Uh, we have talked about it as if it's been official for a long time. But, no, now it is official. So, moving forward, we have uh, a lot of teams in new conferences. The power conference shifts uh, all over the map. We've discussed them at great length. But now we're, we're going to start to put, a, put our money where our mouth is. Um, and we need to figure out what teams in new conferences are going to have the best 2024 seasons, and which ones just made bad decisions moving to conferences, and they're going to have a they're going to pay for it here in 2024. Ooh. All right. Yeah. So maybe we can. Uh, you want to alternate? Yeah, Is that go. what you want to do? Yeah. I'll let you. T I know you've been salivating at the opportunity to to give us your first team that you think is going to have the best 2024 performance in their new conference. My first team that I think is going to make an immediate impact in their new conference, this was a tough decision. Wait, make an impact? Make, make an impact is in possibly win okay, their new okay, conference, okay. but okay. certainly okay. make the 12-team playoff. Yeah. And by the way, how exciting is that? We finally get the 12-team playoff yeah, this glad season. Glad you're finally aboard, too. Uh, I had a That's, tough time. That was like a two-year project. It, yes, but I came around, didn't I? There's hope for Brian, too. Um, so it was tough. I had to narrow this down between two teams that I think uh, the way everything lines up, they're both going to be huge factors in their new conference first season. But I'm going to go with the Oregon Ducks in the Big Ten. Thank you. I feel, you're welcome. Uh, I feel like a couple of things here. I, okay, and I'll just go ahead and say that I'm comparing them to Texas when I'm looking at which of these programs is going to have the the immediate impact and can yeah. vie for the conference championship. So it's funny when you look at Texas and Oregon, so many similarities, both have second best odds to win their conferences. Both of them play the team that's favored to win the conference within the regular season, within the regular season on their home turf. That being Oregon is getting Ohio state to come to Autzen stadium there on October 12th. Texas is getting Georgia on October 19th. Ooh, that's back to back solid weekends there. Um, I need so, to hit my boy Pete Jacobson up. Yes, right. yes, you do. Yeah. So point being, both have the chance to shake up the power structure of the conference. I'm going Oregon just because I feel like the schedule lines up a little better for them than Texas's does. When I look down the duck schedule, I see the out of conference is pretty weak. You know, you got Idaho, Boise State, Oregon State. I'm glad we still get the Civil War, but that's going to be a different Oregon State team with Jonathan Smith. And it's early too. Right? It's early. Yeah. You got UCLA, who I think is going to. We'll get to them in a minute, probably. But Michigan State. All right, then you have Ohio State, and I think that's probably a pick'em right now. I think those are two evenly. Ohio State probably has the best roster in college football, but I feel like Oregon's maybe yeah. second best. Yeah, Buckeyes probably favored on their home turf. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so then you got Purdue at Purdue is uh, a road game. Illinois win. Then you got at Michigan. Michigan's going to take a step back, I feel, with Harbaugh and their defensive coordinator, Jesse Minter, going to the Chargers and then losing 13 to the NFL draft. Maryland, Wisconsin, and you finish with Washington. Washington's going to be a different team. So Wisconsin think, could be a trap. Wisconsin, it could be a trap. So even if you lose one of those, if you can pull off the Ohio State upset, you've got an 11 win season there. Okay. And I think 10. Vegas set the total at ten and a half. So what does that tell you? Yeah. Uh, I think I think eleven wins is realistic. The thing is, if you do beat Ohio State, you're probably playing them. Now that we have no divisions, you're probably playing them again for the Big Ten championship most, at the end of the season. Most likely, yeah. yeah. I think the biggest wild card for the Ducks is probably uh, just what you're getting quarterback play wise. You know, it's a new system for. Oh, I think it's going to be. It'll be seamless. I think. Well, yeah, yeah. Dylan Gabriel. I mean, it's it's accurate. a first first year first system like new terminology. I mean, that's. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm hopeful. I mean, I think that, like, again, we've talked about this, but I think he was one of the the best, you know, uh, pickups in the portal. But, um, yeah, but it's all got to come together on the field, right? Um, so I'll take the other side of that. I, I mean, Texas, I think they're going to, you know, it's hard for me to really decipher which is going to be the tougher conference, the SEC or the Big Ten this year. Um, I think the SEC is probably the edge. Uh, but, you know, I look at Texas's schedule, similar. Again, you mentioned it. They got Georgia, but that's a home game. I, so I see this team with maybe one loss 
maybe two. I mean, yeah. you never know what you get with the Red River shootout, Red River rivalry, uh, a game at AM. Could those Aggies be pesky this year in the home setting? That's the last maybe, one of the maybe, season, maybe right? They, yeah, I, I love know. I love that yeah. one. That we get that rivalry right. game again. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I like Texas. I mean, they, they have you know a lot of their big guns back when you were back. Um, so they're going to be dangerous. Um, let me let me jump into the uh, the the Big Ten or the Big Twelve rather. And uh, this is tough because uh, you went two, and so I'm going to go two here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Utah and Arizona moving into the Big Twelve. I think these two teams are going to be the two teams vying for the win for for the the conference. You um, think so? Yeah, I do. So uh, okay, Utah. I think I, Utah. Yeah, definitely. Well, Arizona is is a young team, and they bring back everybody except I mean, their coach. Well, but ever, all the talent. Yeah. on the field, right? Um, so they have Utah. You know, I see maybe maybe two losses. Um, you know, Cam Rising is back for his 27th year in college football. Um, so I, I really think that, like, the, this Utah team can compete immediately. The Big 12 is, is down, obviously, with Texas and, and OU out. Um, so, I mean, UCF could be one of those teams. It could be a riser program. I, I mean, th- there's some talent in the Big 12, but I think Utah comes in and immediately competes. Both these guys, you know, Utah and Arizona, bringing back a lot of returning starters. No, Noah Fafita, the Arizona quarterback, yes. is exciting. Yeah, so – those are those are two two teams that I think could could have really good years in their first conference. Yeah, yeah. I um, look at teams that are going to have a tough year. I think in the first year in their conference. Yeah. And can I before you get there? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Can I just add one more? Sure. And you're not going to like this one. And this is I'm not saying they're going to win their conference. Okay. I I just think that they're going to have a better year than they had last year in their old conference. Okay. And that would be Colorado. Really? Yeah. I you know I think. You bring it back, Shador Sanders. They they bring back their couple of their main guys. Mm. Um, and Did you notice I they mean, they had they had a four and eight they had a four and eight finish last year. I don't think they win four games this year. You don't think no, so? No. Okay. All right. Hang They're, on. They, hold I, I'm on. Hold you. on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Let me let me pull up their schedule. So we got. Uh, okay, North Dakota State. Obviously, that's an FCS school. But, that, but North, North Dakota State's really good. Like they are usually in the championship game. Okay, but it's a home game. It's week one. Oh, I, no. I think Colorado. Wins. You think North Dakota State? I think gonna it's going to be a close okay. game. I think it's going right. to be a close game. Okay, at Nebraska. Not Nebraska's sure. is going to be good. They, they should be better. They're right. Be they they should be better. Who's their quarterback now? They, oh, they got some. They, yeah, they some got guy. Somebody, yeah. Right? They yeah, they got, got the guy. guy. Yeah, that guy? <laughs> they got oh, that guy. <laughs> uh, at Colorado State, they got Baylor. Okay. Uh, at home. At UCF. I mean, the road games. They they do visit Arizona, Cincinnati, Texas Tech. Utah, uh, uh, they're not competing for the for the conference, but they're at Kansas. The road I games mean, f- are fine, at Nebraska, fine. at Colorado State, at UCF, at Arizona, at Tech, uh, at Kansas. I don't see six wins there. I just I, they couldn't block last year. Uh, they have to protect. Shador. Surely they're going to be better this year. I don't know. They lost a lot to the portal. I mean, guys, a lot of guys didn't Big buy guys, in. Key guys. Well, they didn't have many key guys. The two key, the best guys they have, they still have, which is uh, Travis Hunter. Well, you, and, you know, Dion is predicting Shadour is going to be the number one overall pick. How is that going to happen if, if they if, he, if they don't protect him? He's not. He's going to be. <laughs> Out of a career, <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. I just right. well, I just think you're right. Be you said I, I wouldn't gonna... like. You said I wouldn't like that one, and I didn't like yeah, that. You're one. right. Okay, go for I don't it. Know. Give All me right. the negative. So stuff. I think I think uh, it's going to be tough year one for UCLA. Uh, yeah, you know, I agree. that's probably too easy. That's low hanging fruit. But I look at this. You know, they lose. This is the world we live in. Chip Kelly, former NFL coach, comes to former Oregon coach, goes to the NFL, comes to UCLA. Decent, you know, decent showing last year. The best part of their team last year was their defense. That defense was really good. Now, what happens? Chip Kelly goes, not to be a head coach somewhere else. He goes to be the offensive coordinator yeah. at Ohio the, State. He saw the writing on the he wall. He saw the writing on the wall with the collapse of the Pac-12. And I think he just wants to do what he likes to do, which is call plays and call up. And he's got the be- he's got the best personnel at Ohio State now that he's had since he was at the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, it's going to be ridiculous what they can do. But anyway, so now you're left without him, and you get they hire Deshaun Foster, former UCLA great running back. Yeah. No, you know, no head coaching experience. Uh, but the worst part is they lose DeAnton Lynn, who was their defensive coordinator. He was the that was the best part of the team last year was their defense. Who gets him? Your your rival USC. Lincoln mm-hmm. Riley going to go out and try to fix the one thing that's held him back. His defense goes well, out. And they and get, also lost their quarterback too. Yeah, but Miller Moss, I think, is going to be okay. I mean, oh, is he going to be? Yeah, USC. 
You're right. Uh, I was talking about UCLA. Yeah, UCLA lost their quarterback, but I just think so. I look at their schedule. The Bruins coming into the Big Ten, uh, you know, let, let's assume you can beat Indiana. I don't know. Indiana might be uh, might be sneaky good, but you, they're playing LSU, which is funny that. Um, LSU is playing both USC and UCLA. I don't know what's going on there, but I've got them losing uh, four in a row, LSU, Oregon. No, three in a row, LSU, Oregon, at Penn State. And then I've got them losing four in a row to Rutgers, Nebraska, Iowa, and Washington. I think it's a five-win season. All right, friend. Well, I have Oklahoma taking a step back as they step into the SEC. Um, they were, what, 10-3 and three last year. Uh, I think there's going to be a bit of a rude awakening. Their schedule is not very nice. they got a very difficult uh, schedule. They host Tennessee at the end of September. They take a visit to Auburn. Uh, they have, of course, Texas. Um, they're at Ole Miss. Mm, uh, top 10 got, team there. They end the season at home against Bama and then on the road down in Baton Rouge. Uh, I mean, we're looking at a team that's probably going to have four losses. Well, you at, 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 at Missouri, too. Missouri's probably Missouri, a top 15 team. I mean, it's, yeah. I what just, a welcome to – you look at their schedule and Texas's, and I've heard, you know, Oklahoma fans complaining about this, that Texas got a sweeter – they did. Welcome to the conference oh, in sure. Oklahoma. Yeah. First road game is at Auburn. That's that's a heck of a way to welcome them to the conference. Yeah, no fun. Um, I, I think, obviously, just, you know, Washington's going to take a step back. I mean, I think it might be a little bit of a rough year in the Big Ten for yeah. Washington. I mean, how, how can you not when you lose as much talent and a head coach as they have? Um, and then just kind of a little off the radar, uh, SMU joining the ACC. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were good last year. They finished 11-3. and three. They won the American Conference. They could make some um, noise. Yeah, I don't think. No, I don't think they're going to make any no. noise. In the, you, talk, you go from the American Conference to the ACC. Let I me mean, look at the, I uh, didn't. You know what? I didn't look at any of the ACC teams in this All exercise All you cared here. about was the SEC. I'm Big, Big Ten. Ten. All right. I mean, <laughs> they got uh, – I don't know how good TCU is going to be this year. They got, But they got BYU, TCU, Florida State. Oh, they're at Louisville, at Stanford, at Duke. Louisville's going to be good. Uh, Pitt at home, Boston College at home, at Virginia, and taking on Cal. Smooth. I mean, yeah, I, it's not the, it's not the hardest. I mean, you don't have Clemson on there. I mean, there's it's not the hardest. You don't, you don't, don't have, have Miami. Miami. Yeah. But, I mean. That's not bad, though. But the, the jump in competition, like how can you recruit a roster of American Conference guys and immediately go compete in the ACC, where I mean the recruiting talent is just deeper. I yeah, I think it's it might be a. a, a they rough got some deep year. pockets at SMU though. They sure I they do. They bought some pretty good, pretty yeah. good players. All right, uh, very good. Coming up on the other side, we are going to talk some hockey. We got Bobby the Chief Taylor with us, longtime Lightning uh, analyst, and uh, we'll get his thoughts on the wheelings and dealings oh, man. From over at Amelie Arena. A lot going on. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Nod Pod. Just a little bit of hockey news this week. Just uh, just a little bit, right? Chris? Something yeah, happened, uh, right? I think yeah. so, yeah. Uh, he serves as an analyst for the Tampa Bay Lightning. We welcome into the show Bobby the Chief Taylor. Great to see you, Chief. Uh, you know, you've all you've seen great players come and go uh, throughout the years for this Lightning team. Um, it's, of course, a business side of hockey. We've heard that term used plenty of times this week. Uh, but when it comes to Steven Stamkos, uh, it always just kind of felt like uh, we're going to find a way. There will be a way that he will end up on this Lightning team at the end of the day. How much had you kind of been bracing for the big change this week? Um, were you surprised by it? Uh, not totally. Um, I had a conversation with his dad, Chris, uh, on Thursday, and he said just, you know, keep your uh, eyes and ears open because something could happen. Um, you know, it, it's – you're right when you talk about Steven. I mean, for me, you know, athletes today um, are so bent on on the on the almighty dollar in a sense, you know, and he was not one of them in my mind. I mean, he was a kid that I, I met him when he was 18 years old and he was such a an outgoing, very, very poised kid um, and very, very well brought up. It, it's, I got to tell you a funny story. I told it to my friend J.P. Peterson the other day and and this is how he was brought up. I remember when he first signed with the Lightning and um, Chris, his dad, and Leslie, his mom, were walking in through the back end of the of the uh, Spectrum, or Spectrum, the Amity Arena. You know, it was the Thunderdome back then, but, but uh, for me, and he, they were really mad. And I'm saying, what, what's so wrong, guys? What's all this right? He says, they came over and said, Chief, you've been in this league a long time. You've played a lot of games. You've been everywhere. He says, what would you think of a smart aleck kid Come in there with a signing bonus 
and buys the Mar a Mercedes. He should have bought a Chevy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you guys listen to me. If anybody had the money to buy a Mercedes, they'd buy one. If they had the money to buy a Rolls, they'd buy one. Right. He was really raised right by his by his mom and dad, and he carried that humbleness, you know, and that sincerity practically throughout his whole life and his whole career. You know, he was really such a, a, a gem for us here in Tampa. He always spoke so well. He was always so positive about the city, the fans, his team. And uh, it was just, it, it was really a, a treat to know him all these years. And, uh, you know, I'm just not like he's, I sound like he's dying, but it's not the case. But for me, I don't get to see him as often. And, and that's going to be a real, real empty hole for me. You hit on uh, one of the things about him that was so special. I mean, the expectation, obviously, when he came in here in 2008, number one overall pick, and he, of course, lived up and surpassed those expectations on the ice. But you mentioned kind of just who he is and, and the, the man he grew into and the character traits that are kind of off the ice as well. As we kind of step into this post-Stamkos era, for lack of a better term, uh, we know those contributions on the ice, but what are those intangibles uh, that Stammer brought to the organization that are going to be harder to fill and harder really to quantify? Well, you know, free agency is such a ma major thing now in almost every sport. And it's really that way in hockey. And one of the things that's so important for this team, because, you know, we're kind of the redheaded stepchild in a sense for all the rest of the hockey world down here in Tampa and, and of course over on the other, on the East coast. But, you know, when you've got a new player that comes in, Stammer and his wife are the first people within minutes that call them, reach out to them, yeah. welcome them to the team, the city, making sure that they're looked after, looking sure, making sure that they know where to go, who to ask for, what to do and finding housing and babysitters and dog sitters, everything. Just the things in hockey that people don't realize when we watch them play all the time. And, and that's what he did. He just built this camaraderie and that, you know, they talk about a culture now in sports and especially in hockey. That culture here is permeated from the fact that he, along with Victor Hedman and some guys that have come with him, uh, Al, uh, you know, for me, they're the guys that treat the players. That's what you have to do. The family is so important to a guy that's getting traded because he, he just sometimes you get an hour and you have to jump on a plane and go and meet a team in another city. But the family is so important. And that's what they did so well here. And Stammer was the guy that really started it all. He was the one that made sure that everybody that came was looked after and everybody that came had to look after the new people that were coming behind them. That, that's what made them even spent more special. Chief, you have perspective that the fans don't, obviously, but I know that you can understand the fans' disappointment when we get the news that Monday morning that, indeed, uh, this didn't work out and, and Stamkos is moving on. And not only is he he's moving on, he's going, you know, it's not like he's retiring. He's going to play for the Nashville Predators. Uh, you know, and I think we all as fans kind of went through stages of grief there. There was anger. There was finger pointing. I think now some more the more rational fans have come around to kind of realize that, you know, may, maybe they're this is the right business move to make. But there's no doubt that Julian Breezebois is going to be defined for the rest of, of his tenure by this decision. Now, you've seen him guide the Lightning through this tremendous run they've had with two Stanley Cups. What do you say? Maybe you've had conversations with fans uh, during this time since we learned the news, but what do you tell them to kind of calm them down and, and reassure them that, uh, you know, there is a process here and to have faith in the process? Well, you know, the, we've built this team to a very elite level where we there we are consistently winning the fans expect just to win they want to see us win the players expect to win you know management yeah all the way up to mr vinnick at the top they all want to win because we set they've set a precedent here over the last 10 12 years and we've been a very very good team if not the best team as far as record and and going deep in the playoffs and winning cups in fact i keep telling people the only team that has won more cups since we've came in the league was detroit way back in the 90s. So, you know, three Stanley Cups here, that's a pretty good pedigree for this team. So what happens is we never made the playoff or we got beat out in the first round two years in a row. That doesn't sit well mm -hmm. with the organization. I understand that. You know, Julian has to really start to redefine what we have to do and what we have to, uh, what we have, to have to get better. Um, I think uh, the first shock for me was Sergachev. That really came out of the blue for me getting traded, but they got, 
you know, a really good young player in, in Geeky, uh, you know, a couple of draft picks and another young defenseman. Um, you know, at, at Ryan McDonough coming back is a very, very big move for us because it really solidifies that side uh, of the of the defense on the left side, and that really helps because he and Chernak were a very good pair in our Stanley Cup wins. And uh, when he left, I, I thought Chernak's fit play dropped a bit, but now he's going to be able to get back to where he was. So we're going to have some a really good solid work back there. But we're getting we had to get better up front, and uh, you know, and I think if you take a look at our team, we were the top five in offense. You know, we could score like crazy. We have a really good power play. You know, that's what really carried us through in an old ton of games. But we were the sixth or seventh worst team defensively. And you guys have followed sports all your life. I have followed sports all your life. I don't care what sport it is. If you don't play defense, you're not going to win championships. And that's, what I think, what was the really the motivating factor. We have to get better at a five-on-five. So they have to, you've seen a bunch of signings that we've had over the last couple of days. Gosh, we've signed about 10 guys that we, we could see a, a, a good 25% turnover on our lineup. But that's what Julian is trying to do. He has to try and get us back to being that winning team again. And I guess this was one of the ways where he thought that he had to. He, he, he The thing was that they were going to get, you know, that Gensel from, well, Carolina, but normally from Pittsburgh. But Gensel's a really good player, guys. I'm not. I mean, not, he's not as as dynamic a goal scorer as Steven, but he's a really good player, both offensively and defensively. Mm -hmm. And he's four years younger, or five years younger, excuse me. So, for me, I think you, uh, we have to probably put our emotions. I know I have to get it off my sleeve and put it back in its pocket, <laughs> and uh, you know, to listen and to see what he's trying to do. And I can understand what he was trying to do. But still, you know what? I don't care if you understand or not. It still hurts. Right. I mean, I think this week served as a great reminder that, you know, for as much as every fan wants to play armchair general manager, it, that position is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's obviously not to win popularity contests, but rather to win cups. So in, in light of, of the moves that you've seen, the litany of moves that, the, that you've seen take place already here in the offseason, when you look at this team and what's kind of coming together on paper, do you think that they are in a better position to chase championships? I do. I really do. I, I think what it does, too, sometimes, you know, uh, what they say, a change is as good as a rest. Uh, for me, I think that now you're going to get some new blood in here. Gensel is a, a Stanley Cup champion. He won it with the Pittsburgh Penguins in 2017. We're getting a really good young player in Geeky. He was a 11th round draft pick, 11th overall draft pick by Arizona. So we're getting some really good young players coming in. We've got a lot of uh, defensemen uh, that they've signed, guys that would be borderline NHLers that would probably play more in the, in the American League, but if in a, in a punch, uh, pinch could come up and, and play well for us up top. Uh, and then the key for me is that we have Vassy healthy and rested. Mm -hmm. If you, re you know, everybody kind of uh, bad mouthed them, not us down here, but those so called experts up north. Uh, kept saying about he never was as good as he was before. But, you know, he never had a training camp. The first two months of the season was really him getting back into shape after that back surgery. And I expect him to be back. And he, to me, is our most valuable player, obviously. I think he's going to be healthy, and he's got a very big determination. And I'll tell you what, he's going to prove to everybody that what they were saying, they're going to have a lot of egg on their face. And adding to that, I think our overall depth might be a lot better now. But I'm not. But I know that we lived and died on the power play for the last two years, and it didn't work out. So I think that's what what Julian was trying to get at: that we have to change and become a much more complete team, like we were when we won those cups. We're gonna take a quick break with Chief. When we return on the other side, I'd like to get his thoughts on on the dynamic now that was Stamkos going to Nashville. How good that Predators yeah. team is going to be coming up next year. He wasn't the only one they added. Stay with us. The Nod Pod is back right after this. Joined on the No Off Days podcast by longtime Lightning analyst Bobby the Chief Taylor. Um, so, w I mean, when you look at the team that Stephen Stamkos goes to, uh, a team that, like the Lightning, been making a lot of moves and uh, they're spending a lot of cap dollars, like a lot of cap space to bring in some big name guys. When you look at the Stamkos and, and Marcia So, and they brought in Brady Shea on the defensive side as well, uh, when you look at that Predators, what do you make of, of what they're doing up north? Huh. 
They really did a great job. And, you know, and uh, Sean Henry, who used to be a big major part of the, uh, the our team down here running the building, and uh, Billy Wickett, of course, uh, uh, head of our public mm-hmm. relations and vice president, uh, they're up there now. And I texted Billy. I said, are you going to give it uh, st- Stammer 91? And uh, he said, no, but he said, I wish he didn't have to leave. But for me, they've really done a job on their team. They have really improved their team. Putting Stammer and Marsha show up there, now they have a top six group that is going to be just devastating and a power play that's just going to be phenomenal. They have a really good goalie in UC Saros. Their defense is really solid. Now and, and, and adding another one, another premium defenseman, this team going into the league, into the season next year has got to be uh, one of the favorites to really take it all. And you know, obviously, you have to chem- your chemistry has to really mold itself. But this team on paper, oh boy, they really help their team immensely. And thank goodness we only play them twice. Do yeah. we? I don't know if we know this already, but do, are we going to get some breaking news? Do we know what number Stammer's going to wear for the Preds? No, I don't know really. Okay. I know. I mean. The reason why he had 91 in the first place, guys, is the fact that his favorite player growing up was Stevie Eiserman. Yeah. Oh. And he was 19. And he wore 19 all the time. But I think we had a 19 here when Stevie when uh, Stephen came in. So they he just switched it around to 91 instead of having 19. So he could be 19 or he could be 91. But I think Josie's 19 up there. So he, he's going to have a tough time getting that one. I don't know if I want to see him wearing 91, though. That's <laughs> just That's going to be so weird. Yeah. Tell me, I, you oh, know, I, know. I don't know the, uh, I don't know hockey as well as a lot of people. Tell me how the process, though, of selecting a new captain will will work with the Lightning now. Like, what is it, does that go to seniority? How does that work? Sometimes it's there's two ways of doing it. Sometimes it's the coach that comes in and just automatically appoints somebody, uh, and other times it's just the players themselves whom they're going to vote for, you know. And uh, the one thing that they have in that dressing room right now, guys, is they've got a lot of leaders, you know, yeah. led by he- Victor Hedman. You know, Ryan McDonough is a huge voice in that room, even though he's been gone for a couple of years. Uh, you know, he went in both those cups. He was a big, big part of that that group of guys that really made everybody feel comfortable and that spoke up when you needed to be uh, kicked in the butt, uh, you know, to get your butt going. And I, you know, he'd be a good uh, uh, candidate as well. But in my mind, I would really think it might be Victor, mainly because he's been here the longest. He's a very, very important person on the team. And when he speaks, you know, people really listen. Yeah. And uh, some big news coming down on uh, Hetty as well with a four-year extension this week. Y- you know, before we let you go, I, you know, I feel like what this kind of era of lightning hockey that we've been able to witness here uh, in the recent years, and, and who knows what the future has in store, you know, it, it feels like it maybe is not quite as appreciated as it should be. You know, I yeah. mean, when you look at the guys that have come through this place uh, that are currently on the roster between Stammer, Kucherov, Fassi, I mean, these these guys, all uh, 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 Hall of Famers on this roster, do you think that we can in real time truly appreciate the Hall of Fame caliber talent that we've been able to watch on this one team in this era of Lightning Hockey? Well, I, I think here we can. I think here a lot of us know you know, what bothers me, and I keep calling them the idiots up there because they make dumb decisions, uh, you know, for me, I- I'm shocked that uh, Cooch never got the most valuable player yeah. because of his season. I mean, there hasn't been a winger in the history of the game that scored 100 assists. He had 50% of his points on the road. You know, the guy that won it, don't get me wrong, uh, in Colorado, you know, but he had 65% of his points at home. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, what we do, you're always tougher at home than you are on the road. And, you know, Stammer or uh, Gooch was just a phenomenal player. He was 50 points ahead of the closest guy, which was Braden Point in points. You know, you just don't you just don't win when you uh, without him because of that factor that he was such a dominant player for us. You know, and um, so I don't think we get the just dues down here as they do from the north and in, in the northeast and. I'm talking in Canada for sure, but I don't even if in the in the northern part of the country, up in the, the you know the Boston, New York, Philly area, you know those guys they they don't watch us as much. And this team is so good; they've got such great players and such great talent uh, uh, people off the ice. And I think I I think we here in Tampa understand and know how good they are and how great they are because we get to see them in a more personal sense sometimes uh, than you do any other people, but. 
up there they don't they don't seem to watch us you know it it just drives me crazy you should you guys should hear me and Phil when we get a couple of beers. Oh, in this yes. I'm we, sure. want, we want that podcast. Yeah, let's, let's go there. <laughs> hey, got their own. Can I get one more? I Since you mentioned Philly, can I get one more? And, uh, you know, we have to mention the beautiful Flyers jerseys we see over your shoulders there. You were oh, yeah. part of two Stanley Cup teams, the Philadelphia Flyers in 74-75. True or false that Flyer great Bernie Perrant uh, called you chef instead of exactly. chief? Exactly. Okay. Well, what it was is that chef is the French pronunciation of chief. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and and Benny wasn't the most intel most uh, uh, calm person in the world. He was a little wacky, like us all goalies are. And Ben was something else, and we were we became really really good friends. But he would call me chef, and then the guys just picked it up. So when people would yell chief, and you know if you were in a hurry, I knew it wasn't one of the teammates or one of the guys that knew us really well. So it would became chef, and and. Uh, it was really, really funny uh, when he was. He started to do that. It was, it was incredible. And uh, it's, you know, when it started when I was in the minor leagues, guys were starting to call me Savage to begin with. Then it became Tonto. Then it became, um, you know, then they, then it became Chief. And that's when it kind of ended up as Chief. But Bernie called me Chef, and it really stuck with all the guys on the team. And he can whip up a mean chicken piccata as well. <laughs> he is Bobby yeah. the Chief Taylor. We appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us and, and talking a little bit of hockey. Of course, uh, the season will be here before you know it. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. I know. Thanks, guys. Thanks. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. We are back on the No Off Days podcast. It's a fun little chat with Bobby the Chief Taylor. I like talking yeah, to him. No, he's he's a good one. And I, I really would like to take him up on that offer of having him and Espo. And yes. then maybe you know, they can crack a beer and then tell some old stories. That would be can the best. Can you imagine? Oh, my Actually, goodness. Actually, they have a podcast. I think they do that very thing. So. But let's not promote it no, on this no, no, podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> no, let's see if we can absorb it. Can we take it over, Brian? Uh, let's bring in BK. Um, BK, do you think that we can uh, – purchase the, the rights of that podcast and then just become well, one that's a good thought yeah cannibalize wow. we need we need something how much capital do we have in this yeah. this podcast um, well let's see i don't know let's we need to raise some more mug. money we blew a lot of our budget on the cake bracket we unfortunately did. yeah we're gonna have to wait we, yeah we've maxed our cap we have no more cap space <laughs> in fact chris has it's been traded <laughs> chris is gone <laughs> <laughs> several things will be deleted here in short order i hope you're not one of them okay all right, so uh, our last thing, you said we were going to have to do a, a test. Fourth of uh, July quiz. Okay. Okay, apple I, pie. I was never good with quizzes well, in school. This I, is not, I'm nervous. I helped you out a little bit. I made a multiple choice. Okay. Okay, that, so okay. the answer, you'll see the answer up I'm on the board. I'm a good guesser. You, well, we'll see. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah. Here we go. How much money is spent each year on fireworks for the Fourth of July? Hmm. Is it 10 million, 100 million? 500 million or 2 billion dollars uh, each um, year how much money is spent by just by consumers uh well, just, let's say consumers and professionals okay oh okay i mean I, I, five two billion seems a, a bit steep uh, but there's a big jump between 500 there million and some. 2 billion because i really want to say about 1.25 million but since that's not an option <laughs> i'm just gonna go for gold baby let's go two billion is it two billion that, that, go, that my mean? instinct was to say when you said professionals brian that made me think of how all these cities put on these extravagant shows and they usually give us the budget for it because that is public record and it's always a you know a, a, at least in the double digit millions and if right. every city's doing that i'm gonna say and it's sad since all of these fireworks are made in china but i'm gonna say america is spending two billion dollars a year mm. on fireworks mm. that is correct it's mm. actually 2.7 billion that's dollars. crazy it is 2.7 billion 2.7 billion dollars each year on, on fireworks china loving uh, it how many yeah. roads could be repaved with that and just a little side note, 73% of firework injuries happen on the 4th of July. Of course. Of course. Okay, here's the next one. How many hot dogs will be eaten in America on the 4th of July? Well, I mean, uh, Joey Chestnut's not competing. Yeah, so that's going to take the number. takes the number down a bit. Um, I don't know. I'll let you venture into this water first. In this wa hot dog water. Yes. Okay. Uh, boy, you know, a colleague and I were having this discussion recently he said how often a year do you eat a hot, how many hot dogs do you eat a year and i was like i don't know you get go to a few ball games you get one let's say you do two 
on the fourth. I'm never, never going to do more than two on the fourth because I'm going to get a burger and some other things. So if everyone's, you know, consuming, let's say on a, a gluttonous year, you might eat 20 dollars. it's not asking you for a year. It's asking on, on the, the fourth. fourth. Okay. So just two. And how many people? We have eight. Uh, we have three. We have eight billion. Eight million <laughs> three, in this. Yes, eight million in this country. Million, right? We have 300, 300 million. Yeah, something million. like that. Um, I'd say 150 million. Um, I mean, there's no way it's just a million. A million hot dogs. I mean, I'm gonna put a dent in that myself. Um, let's see. I'm gonna go 200 million. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna max contract this one. It's 250 million. That How was, come all of your answers are incorrect? That wasn't on the board. <laughs> that wasn't on the board. <laughs> no. Oh, your first it was two 200 answers. Two hundred million. Yeah. Okay. okay. Two hundred million. I think you meant one hundred fifty million, Brian. No, it was two hundred fifty. Okay. Yeah. Two hundred fifty. Right. For this next one, whatever it is, I'm going to say uh, my answer is E, the one that's not listed. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. All right. How about this? Let's get a little history in this. Which president was born on July fourth? George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Calvin Coolidge, Benjamin Franklin. Okay. Well, Benjamin Franklin wasn't a president. Oh, gosh. So you got that. me? <laughs> uh, I don't know much. Um, I'm going to go Coolidge mm -hmm. because uh, it seems like when you were constructing this question that, I mean, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln had to be on that list. Uh, and then Benjamin Franklin, I, you're smarter than that. And, and we Cal always Calvin Coolidge. And we celebrate President's Day near Washington's birthday, right? Every year, that's when we have. Do we? And also, Lincoln's are both in February. I'm pretty sure. I celebrate his but, birthday on Labor Day. Uh, let's suppose you for yeah. Based on Brian's track record so far, I should say Herbert Hoover, but uh, I'm going to go Calvin Coolidge too. <laughs> it's Calvin Coolidge. Okay. 1872, right. and I did put Benjamin Franklin on there as a joke. I yeah. know he's not a president. Because you thought that I was dumb enough to fall for it. I was hoping y'all yeah, were yeah. dumb enough. He, but. <laughs> Look how little faith he has in us. Yeah. He should have been a president, though. He would have been a great one. He would have been a great one. Okay, which president died on July 4th? Oh, that's Ooh. macabre. Oh. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Polk, or Millard Fillmore? Oh, my okay. favorite president on there. Fun fact, I just learned about John Adams today. He had the first dogs in the White House because Washington, I guess, didn't actually live in the White House. Oh, really? So Adams' two dogs, the name of his two dogs were Juno and Satan. Wow. John Adams had a dog named Satan. That's wow. interesting. How, how, do you, how bad of a dog do you have to be? Get behind me, <laughs> Satan. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so what are you going to go with there? Uh, I don't you know. You know his dog's names, but do you know when he uh, died? I'm going to go James Polk because he seems like a guy who would want a really patriotic death. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I love Millard Fillmore. I don't know anything about him, but I just love his name. So I'm going to go Millard Fillmore for the win. It's actually kind of a trick question. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both died on July 4th in the same year. Wow. wow. Thomas Jefferson died at noon, and then a few hours later, John Adams died. 50th Ad anniversary of the uh, Declaration of Independence, 1826. What? what? That's, yeah. That's more than coincidence. See, I thought y'all knew that. That's all, I thought that was common knowledge. How, like how far apart in age were they? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, but Adams was the second president and Jefferson was third, right? Yeah, okay. it's probably not far. So, yeah. So Adams was like, no, Thomas, you're they not going to be the only one to die he on this day. Because they were both sick, and I think Adams wanted to outlive him, and that was one of his wow. final words. Yeah. What a, he probably had uh, oh, the dog Satan over there he uh, probably did. <laughs> cheering him on. <laughs> you could hang in there hey, a couple more hours. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <Join me>. Okay, <laughs> which of these events happened on July 4th? The Battle of Gettysburg ends. Lou Gehrig gives his luckiest man speech. Mm. The United States first unveils a 50-star flag. And Curiosity, the rover lands on Mars. Which of those events happened on July 4th? Mm. Uh, is there a chance that this could also be a trick question, BK? You answer the question. I am just give the questions. Okay. <laughs> know your role. Well, it would make sense that the U.S. would unveil a 50-star mm -hmm. flag on the 4th of July. That would make a lot of sense. Or on Flag Day. Uh, I'm not sure when the Battle of Gettysburg ended, but that seems like it would uh, Yeah, it just seems like that wouldn't make sense. I think it was more in the fall. You think so? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Lou Gehrig's speech, that's middle of the season. I'm going to go Lou Gehrig's speech, luckiest man speech, July 4th. Yeah, I'm going to go. I think that's maybe right. I'm going to go Curiosity Rover 
lands on Mars. That seems like a, you know, they timed it out. It's, it's kind of a new frontier, if you want to look at it that way. I think people mm. have used that phrase oh, to describe yeah. face, yeah. Uh, space. Um, so yeah, Curiosity rover on July 4th planted its flag on the red planet. All right. All of those events happened on July 4th. Night that's what I was thinking. Yeah, okay. how about yeah, that? Yeah, and that. also the Louisiana Purchase, July 4th. Huh. That was a big land grab there. But yeah, Hawaii, they made Hawaii officially a state. July 4th in 19, thing. what year, Scott? You're Hawaiian. Aloha. In those um, yeah, well, I'm wearing a, yeah, Hawaiian shirt. Um, yes. I would say uh, Hawaii became a state in 1965. Uh, no, 1960. Oh, no close. Yeah. There you go. There's your 4th of July. That well, there fun. we go. Hey, that was good. I feel more patriotic after doing Do that. Do you? John Adams and that was cool. Thomas Jefferson dying on, on the, the same, same day. Do you think you and I could arrange something like that? Yes. We just drink the <laughs> hemlock together. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the cool I would go like this. Uh, yes, go. Yeah. yeah. yeah here, you, you go first. All right. Cheers. Uh, it's been a good run, We'll buddy. see you on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> what a week. Yes. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Let the flag fly and uh, an old glory. Never take her down. That's right. Never take her down. Our thanks to our guest, Bobby the Chief Taylor, and uh, and much thanks to our studio crew, Mariah running the jib, and we got uh, we got Chris on the ones and twos, BK back in the mm -hmm. booth. For Chris, I'm Scott. Until the next time we're on, there are no off days. Never. All right. Down the hatch. <laughs>